Hey all, thanks in advance for watching this episode of The Completionist. If you don't know, starting this month, we're giving patrons on our Patreon, in our mini producer tier and above, the opportunity to submit what games they'd love to see me complete on the show. The first thing for submission is Metroidvania, so head over to patreon.com slash thecompletionist today and let your voice be heard. Thanks so much, and now on to the show. Time is the fire in which we all burn. No matter who you are or what your situation is, time is marching us forward to the same place. Time and death are two of the only things that are totally out of our control. So it makes sense that such a huge percentage of all of our art is about these two concepts. Game designer Jonathan Blow literalized humankind's desire to control time in his masterpiece of a puzzle platformer, 2008's Braid, which elevates tired video game tropes by deconstructing them, and ties all of its gameplay choices into ruminations on the nature of time, obsession, and our impossible desire to undo our own mistakes. Hey everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Now, it's been quite a while since I've personally played Braid, but I remember it breaking my brain in the best way possible when it first came out, because a game about the nature of time should break your brain. And I'll be honest, I even considered doing this entire episode in reverse before I realized how complicated it would be to do that, but that's time for you. Unknowable, mysterious, and totally beyond your control. And with that, this is Braid. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! Danger! That's right, we're starting with section two. Just like how Braid starts you off in World 2. Is it confusing? Sure. But it's one of the several intentional disorienting choices made to keep you off balance from the very beginning of the game. And that's just one of the many reasons that Braid has been hugely influential for over a decade. It was one of those immediately eye-catching games that brought tons of attention to the large amount of innovation happening at the edge of the industry. And there's a reason that Jonathan Blow has become a legend in the realm of puzzle games, even though he's only made Braid and the equally excellent The Witness. Jonathan Blow has been very candid about his desire to disrupt tired gaming cliches, both in interviews and in his segments in the film Indie Game the Movie. Even outside of a direct follow-up like The Witness, the influence of his approach to the story, theme, and the integration of those elements directly into puzzles and gameplay can be seen in countless games since. And even though Braid wasn't the first or last game to build itself around the manipulation of time, it still feels like the definitive one. It lulls the player into a false sense of security with simple seeming platforming reminiscent of classics like Super Mario Brothers, before throwing in a button that can reverse time. And even though that one simple mechanic changes the nature of all sorts of classic platformer moves like jumping on enemies, Braid doesn't just stop there. The basic goal of collecting puzzle pieces is the same in every one of the game's worlds, but with each one it throws a new time-based wrinkle at the player. So every time you think you've gotten on the game's wavelengths, it forces you to use the manipulation of time in a new way, like like objects that can resist the reversal of time's flow, a shadow that runs back your actions when time moves forward, and even a ring that selectively slows the passage of time in certain areas. And Brain treats its story in the same way, with a simple setup that gets complicated over and over again. Tim, the player-controlled character, is on a quest to rescue a princess who he keeps getting told is in another castle. Cause, well, you know. Text passages at the start of each world fill in a few details about Tim's life and his state of mind, and it all leads up to an ending that challenges the assumptions people might make about a game with such a generic sounding setup. Lots of stuff is left open to interpretation, and the story exists largely as a way of making you think about the game's central themes and how they connect to the gameplay. The puzzle pieces can be collected in pretty much any order, and while I'm sure there are at least a few levels that will test my patience, the whole joy of games like this is getting to experience that eureka moment where everything clicks and you realize what you're supposed to do. But just figuring out the solution isn't the end of it. Braid also has a speedrun component, which means familiarizing myself with the puzzles to the point that I can beat the entire game in under 45 minutes, which is 
pretty fast. That's like 15 minutes less than the average episode of a Netflix show, you guys. There are also some stars to collect on top of the puzzle pieces, and apparently they're extremely well hidden. So even though Braid is a super short game, those two components will add a decent chunk of, well, time to the completion process. You know that song, Time Is On My Side? Yeah, well, that's not true. It's never been true. The Rolling Stones lied. Time is a total dick. It's clear that both from the game itself and the words of its developer that a major part of Braid's purpose was to deconstruct tired gaming tropes. But fortunately, it also realizes that there's only value in deconstruction if you're willing to construct something new in its place. Braid is a game that's in conversation with video game history, and that's clear pretty much immediately when the game starts by confronting you with an overwhelming number of Mario references. Your princess is in another castle, has been courted to death, but there's a huge difference between just coasting off the reference and what Braid does, which is forcing the player to stop and consider what that actually means. This spirit of deconstruction applies to gameplay choices too, by taking platformer activities that pretty much everyone is familiar with and then making you feel like a dummy for approaching them in a way you're used to. Like jumping on an enemy, which loses basically all of its function as an offensive maneuver when the enemies you're jumping on are moving backwards and forwards throughout time. Even when one of them kills you, you're just going to be rewinding to right before it happened. which means that even referring to them as enemies doesn't feel quite right. They're a necessary part of nearly every puzzle, which turns the act of jumping on their heads into less of an attack and more like an act of collaboration as they boost you up onto the new platforms. Then there are the jigsaw pieces themselves, which seem at first like exactly the sort of collectible you'd normally find in a platformer. Collect this many stars to get through a door, etc, etc. We all know the drill here. And while you do need all 60 puzzle pieces to access Braid's final world, they can be gotten in pretty much any order you want. Which means that if one is too frustrating or you can't figure out how to get it, you can come back for it later, after a later puzzle has reshaped your concept of time. Collecting all of the pieces and assembling them into a finished puzzle is also more satisfying than just feeding some collectibles to a door. And you get to see those puzzles on display in Tim's house throughout the game as a marker of your progression through each world. Collecting puzzle pieces is still the ultimate goal of the game, but Braid takes that goal and separates it from your forward movement through it. And because I didn't have to keep throwing myself at a puzzle in order to access the next one, I was way more willing to come back to stuff later when I had a bit more context. It's like a psychological equivalent of a Metroidvania, but instead of unlocking new skills that open up new areas, we have to unlock new ways of thinking about the passage of time. The same is true of the stars, which form a constellation on the game's opening screen when found, and seem specifically designed to mess with the player's growing confidence as they move through the game. Not only are they, like, upsettingly well hidden, but some of them are so much trouble that they force you to question whether it's worth it. For example, there's one star, which is one of the earliest ones in the game, that requires you to wait almost two hours for a cloud to move across the sky. Or another that is totally missable if you assemble the World 3 puzzle, which straight up caused me to restart the game. And those are probably the easiest ones. It feels like a very deliberate meta commentary on this sort of ultra hard collectible. And getting the stars ended up feeling like a totally different experience from getting the puzzle pieces, even though they're all unlocked with the same basic concepts. Because sure, Braid looks like a platformer, but it's really just using platformer aesthetics and concepts to present players with a pure puzzle game, designed to reward experimentation over forward progress. Now The Witness is a very similar thing here, where what the game looks like comes into direct conflict with what the game actually is. And it raises the question of what Braid actually is, when it's so clear about what it's not. But the answer is right there in Braid's main objective. You can't solve a puzzle until you have all of the pieces. Video games face an extra layer of difficulty when it comes to storytelling, because they have to account for gameplay and the actions of each individual player. The games that are most successful at telling a story or communicating a theme or message are the ones that approach gameplay as an impossible to separate element of that storytelling. And that's exactly what Braid does. It's not a story-driven game by any means, but all of its thematic interests are linked directly to the gameplay, like regret over one's past, obsession as an unhealthy motivator, and nostalgia and wistfulness for a less fraught and difficult time in one's life. 
This stuff is all present in the abstract little text snippets at the beginning of each level, but it's mostly present in the puzzles themselves. Each world explores a different concept's relationship to time, like time and forgiveness in chapter two, or time and place in chapter four. And that's really the game's main goal, to use every element from the gameplay to the music, to the story, to the art direction, to get you thinking about time in new ways. The art and music is wistful and old fashioned, taking a classical approach that immediately invokes ideas of the past and gets you reflecting on the nostalgia, art, and the way that one's relationship to the piece of art can change over time. The puzzle pieces can be obtained in any order, effectively giving you the feeling of having all the time in the world to collect them. And assembling the collected pieces into finished jigsaw puzzles evokes a classic way of passing the time. Even the stars make the player wonder whether they're worth the excess amount of time and energy it takes to collect them. Making the player wait two hours to cross a level is a little bit of a dick move, but it's definitely a pretty direct and confrontational way to get them thinking about these ideas. And then of course, there's the speed run. Of course this game has a speed run because it's not going to pass up a single goddamn opportunity to make you think about time. This game is even more determined to make me think about time than, I don't know, Primer. In that movie, like, really made me think about time. And a speedrun is a great way to keep highlighting those themes while also giving diehard completionists like me a big scary goal to accomplish. Because in order to clear Braid's speedrun and to unlock the final achievement, you have to beat Braid in under 45 minutes, which is just not a lot of time here. And this is honestly the only real achievement too. There are more for traversing each world and completing each puzzle, but that's it. It's like the game doesn't want to waste your time with anything that's not directly tied to its major themes. All of the other achievements will happen over the course of a normal playthrough. And the game needs something to keep you coming back after you've finished and gotten to a pretty great twist ending that forces you to re-examine all of the game's hints about what story it's telling. And honestly, it's a totally different game during the speed run because I was no longer having to throw myself at a puzzle until until it made sense to me. I already knew all the solutions, so it all comes down to execution and shaving so many seconds off of each level as is humanly possible. It definitely took a few tries, but figuring out the puzzles is such a huge part of what the game is, and that it's almost jarring to return to it for a speed run and find that element totally missing. It now feels much more like a platformer where the emphasis is on making your way through the levels with speed and precision. And obviously I'm down with that. I play a lot of platformers, including all the ones that the game loves to reference, but it did feel like the least essential part of the overall all great experience. Even the stars, which were pretty annoying, felt like a big part of the picture that Braid is painting here, or rather, the puzzle that it's assembling. Because by the time I'd gotten to the speed runs, I'd been forced to think about this game's conception of time from every conceivable angle. And doing a speed run fits neatly into these themes, but without really adding much to them. It's not to say that flying through the puzzles like some kind of unstoppable time god wasn't fun, because like, come on. Everyone wants to be an unstoppable time god, let's be real. Collecting all the puzzle pieces doesn't get you anything other than access to the final world, but the stars actually unlock a secret ending, which isn't too bad as far as rewards go. It's not like I was expecting any crazy new time powers or anything, although I would obviously be down. But another ending isn't bad, and gives more insight into Braid's strange, mysterious story. Same goes for beating the game the first time through, which mostly gets you an epilogue with a bunch of new text excerpts, including some secret ones in case you want to try to decode the story even further. And it's good that the stars have a decent reward because they're a little bit grueling. As far as the speedrun goes though, I had to be happy with an achievement, which is, as I've noted many times before, better than nothing, I guess. Fortunately, it didn't take too many tries, or I would probably be much saltier about it all. While I completed Braid, there were 60 puzzle pieces collected and assembled into five different puzzles. Six worlds traversed, ending in world one because time is tricky like that. 12 achievements unlocked, nine hours of total playtime, if you count the two hours where I had to wait for a cloud to move through the sky, and an unknown number of deaths because it turns out death is meaningless when you control the flow of time. Honestly, it's made me drunk with power. There's definitely a reason that Braid was at the forefront of the public's awareness of early indie games, and that it's continued to be so influential. Between this and The Witness, it's clear that Jonathan Blow just knows how to build great puzzles and how to use them in service of really weird, really cool ideas. 
Some of the puzzles were familiar to me from when I played them years ago, but others I'd forgotten, and I'm glad because it meant this game got to break my brain all over again. And while it was definitely worth revisiting, some of the stars did test my patience a bit, and the same goes for that glorious speedrun. So, with that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It!